Well, hello, Confirmands. It is good to talk to you again. Uh, we continue to be in year three. This is lesson nine. We are continuing our march through the small catechism, and today we are on the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Uh, just a, uh, a few announcements before we jump in. Uh, I think last week there was only one of you who forgot to put your name on your paper, uh, earning the title of Domosaurus Rex. But, you know, it's, it's improvement. It's hard for me to believe with 7th, 8th, and ninth graders that the uh, thing that we're struggling the most of uh, this year is to put names on papers, but that is in fact where we are. Uh, if you would uh, be conscientious about that, it helps your poor old pastor. I appreciate it. Uh, we have begun our readings in the book of Acts. You should be in your second week in the book of Acts uh, this week. Uh, remember, Acts is, uh, the full name is Acts of the Apostles. It's the story of the early church, the first expansion of Christianity uh, into, the, into the broader world, into the Gentile world. Uh, and it's got stuff in there, you know, uh, disagreements between the early church uh, and, and uh, working things out together. What is it that we believe? What are the rules? Who's in charge? Uh, so there's a lot in there that, that continues to be useful for us today, even if, you know, you don't remember who exactly the name of the Roman centurion was or, you know, that, that's important, but it's not as important as, as understanding some things about this life that we share together. So. Now pay, pay attention, do your readings, you know, uh, some of you haven't turned in any reading sheets yet, which makes me wonder if you're, if you're doing them, uh, but, but get going on those. We've also entered a new church year, uh, starting this Sunday, uh, uh, December, what is it, 3rd, uh, we go into Advent. Advent is the first season of the church year. Uh, the colors of Advent are either blue uh, for heaven or purple for royalty. Uh, it's a four-week season. It's a penitential season. It's one of the two penitential seasons of the church year. The other one is Lent, and we are going to review all this. Uh, but a penitential season is a season uh, of penitence, a season of, 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 of deep personal reflection, of, of asking that God would, would show us our sins, show us our errors, and help us to improve. Uh, it's a season in which we look forward to the coming of Christ, and of course, that's got two different branches, both holy. You walk either one, you know, take your turn, go back and forth. Uh, but one branch, we're waiting for Christ to come at Christmas, and we, we celebrate the miracle of, of God becoming a human being, God loving us enough uh, to divest God's self of God's powers uh, and majesty and taking on our form, a form which God the Son still holds somewhere in the universe. There's a, a, a five foot two inch guy uh, Jesus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, and so Advent is a time for us to contemplate, to think about uh, the love of God, uh, that God loves us so much that God was unprepared to spend eternity without us. Uh, wasn't going to watch us march blindly and stupidly into hell uh, without doing everything, including laying down God's own life uh, to, uh, to, to bring us back, to, to bring us home. So there, there's plenty to think about there for the rest of your life. Right? Um, and uh, any adults watching this, uh, the best book, the best book that I know about, maybe that Christianity is produced on this, uh, is uh, by Saint uh, Athanasius, uh, and it's called On the Incarnation. And you can get it on Amazon for six bucks. Uh, so either on your Kindle or, or hard copy, but uh, Athanasius, Saint Athanasius, uh, saved the church, by the way, uh, and has nothing to do with the Athanasian Creed. Uh, which bears his name, uh, but uh, was was involved in in uh, and and you know, did the intellectual work for the Nicene Creed. So it's, you know, it's odd. Anyway, uh, Saint Athanasius on the Incarnation and uh, Confirmands, you are absolutely capable of reading this book too. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a wondrous book. The other path uh, for Advent is that we remember that Christ is coming again uh, in power at the end of time. Uh, that Christ will judge the living and the dead, that the dead will be raised, and the dead and the living together will stand before Christ, uh, and, and, uh, and there'll be a, a judgment, and there'll be an ushering in of the kingdom of light. Uh, and so these four weeks we prepare ourselves for Jesus to come, both as the baby in Bethlehem uh, and as the king of kings at the end of time. Uh, the color blue represents heaven, the color purple is royalty, 
the season is Advent, one of the two penitential seasons of the church year, the other one being, right, Lent. All right, we're going to cover all of that when we get together. I think those are the announcements. First three words of the phrase that pays, the right person, the right person. Okay, so three words out of three so far. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. What is this? What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we lead pure and decent lives in word and deed. And each of us loves and honors his or her spouse. We are to fear and love God so that we lead pure and decent lives in word and deed. And each of us loves and honors his or her spouse. Where does this come from in the Bible? It comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. All right? So just a reminder where we are. We are on the sixth commandment. We are on the second table of the law. Remember, we, we did this... Uh, this Is it a fiction? Is it a convenience? Uh, we, we, we're playing this pretend or this game, this supposition, that there's two tablets to the law. We don't actually know that. On the first are the rules about how we're to live with God and under God, and on the second, how we're to live with one another. This is our third commandment on the second table. It's the sixth altogether. Uh, and there's a progression on this table uh, about how we're supposed to live with our neighbors. Did, did, you, did you print this? You should print this. You should be following along with me. Right? There's a progression. Uh, that the fourth commandment says that we're supposed to honor our father and mother, and you and I understand that to mean that we're supposed to give appropriate honor to everyone in authority over us. We're supposed to distinguish between appropriate and inappropriate authority. We're supposed to submit to the one and resist the other. Uh, but that, that uh, you and I have an obligation to live, to find our place in society, to lead where we're called to lead, to follow where we're called to follow, uh, and to honor the, uh, the authority of those uh, who have uh, a righteous position over us. Right? Then we talked, uh, you shall not murder, that we have an obligation not just to not take anyone's life illegitimately, but we're supposed to protect our neighbor's lives. Uh, that There's no moral victory. Uh, to say I haven't I haven't murdered anyone, wherein I let people starve, uh, that that's that's uh, that's not a moral victory. That's a failure. That you and I are supposed to preserve and protect the lives of our neighbors, uh, insofar as we are able, and that that, that is what that means. Uh, that we are to keep this commandment, not to murder. So uh, give honor to those uh, with with appropriate authority. Protect the lives uh, of our neighbors. Uh, and then uh, here today we're, we're taking one more step uh, at protecting our neighbor's marriage and our neighbor's honor. It matters uh, uh, how our neighbor uh, is seen in society. It matters, our, our neighbor's position in society matters. Uh, that here specifically in, in areas of sexuality we're not to humiliate or to demean uh, our neighbor in any way. We're to protect our neighbor and lift up our neighbor. We'll get to that as we go, but there's, there's this progression on the second table uh, of, the, of the commandments. So the sixth commandment, right? Third on this second table. No adultery, right? Adultery doesn't just mean uh, sex. Uh, adult, to adulterate something means to make it impure or to pollute it. Uh, that periodically you'll see on food labels, non-adulterated. That nothing has been added to it that shouldn't be there. Right? That, that what you got when you open the wrapper is exactly what's supposed to be there, nothing more, nothing less. It is non-adulterated. It hasn't been polluted. It hasn't been uh, uh, stretched. It hasn't been cut. Uh, that, that, it, that everything that's supposed to be there is there, nothing more and nothing less. Right? There's no pollutants. There's no contaminants. It is not adulterated in any way. So uh, this is uh, no adultery. And specifically, this is about... Uh, sex, uh, that we're not supposed to mess around uh, with the purity of our marriage or anyone else's marriage. That, that if you are in a marriage, if you are partnered with someone, uh, that is the person with whom you're supposed to have sex and no one else, uh, not in your mind, not with your body. I mean, that, 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 is, uh, that person is God's gift to you and you are, that, uh, you are God's gift to that person and both of you have an obligation not to adulterate that relationship, not to bring anything into it that shouldn't be there. 
right? That, that what you want in that relationship is everything that should be there and nothing that shouldn't be there. You want it to be pure and you want it to be perfect and you want it to be good, right? Uh, there's also no messing around with anyone else's marriage, right? Uh, we don't do anything that makes it harder for someone else to stay married. Uh, we don't talk to one another about uh, how, you know, well, oh, Frank, your wife has always been awful and well, everyone hates her. You know, we don't, we don't do that. We don't talk down someone else's marriage partner. Uh, we don't uh, get between them. We don't flirt with married people. We don't encourage married people to, to stray from their promises. Now, we should just say here as clearly as we can, right, you know, that, that if, if someone comes to you and says that they're being abused in their marriage, right, you're not committing adultery if you help them find a safe haven, if you help them, um, you know, even leave uh, an abusive marriage. Right, that's that's not adultery. Again, that there's there's sometimes where where marriages are at a place where they have to be paused or separated to try to rebuild the thing, uh, and there are sometimes when marriages where you just have to rescue someone out of out of a marriage that is uh, horrifically bad, painful, dangerous. Right. Uh, so this is this is not committing adultery, but you're not trying to, to have sex with that person that you're rescuing from the dangerous marriage. You're trying to protect their life. Remember we just talked about, you know, that, that there's this progression of commandments. And so the commandment that we do shall not murder includes protecting someone's life. If someone's life's in danger, you rescue them from whatever that situation is, even if it's a marriage. But you're not trying to exploit that, that rescue for your own purposes, right? So if someone comes to you and says, you know, I'm, I'm in fear of my life, uh, I'm being I'm being abused. I'm being threatened. Right? You know, he's he's walking around with guns, right? You get him out of the marriage. You get him to the police. You get him someplace safe, right? But you're not at the same time trying to set up a date with them. You're not at the same time trying to to start something of your own with that person, right? We can talk as much as you want. I mean, I I'm I belong to you. I'm your pastor. We can talk as much as you want about. You know, you rescue someone from an abusive marriage and then a divorce happens. How much time should go past before you can start talking and making decisions about can you date this person? But, you know, big picture, don't interfere with anyone else's marriage. Don't let anything mess up your marriage, right? Stay away from, from the fence line. Stay away from, from temptation. Uh, don't, don't, don't start anything that... that that might go bad, right? Just don't do it. Um, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's an old expression, uh, the grass is always greener uh, on the other side of the fence. First, that's not true, right? And second, you know, a very wise person once said, you know, water your own grass. That if you're in a marriage, uh, instead of flirting with other people or wondering what else is out there or, you know, fantasizing about what else is out there, you take care of your marriage. You take care of, of the communication part of it, you take care of the financial part of it, you take care of the relational part of it, you take care of the sex part of it, that, that you are working to, to keep your own marriage. And you don't have time to be thinking about someone else. You don't have time to be fantasizing about someone else. Just do your job, be where you are, right? do your best before God, keep your marriage pure, keep your vows right? to love, honor, and cherish this other person as long as you both shall live. Right? And, and pray that they do the same, right? I mean, we can, we can talk about divorce if you want, uh, but, but here we're just talking about the sanctity of marriage, about protecting this thing, uh, that, that if you're in uh, this kind of relationship, then the other person uh, deserves your whole heart and your whole attention, your whole mind, uh, and God wants it to be that way. God wants us to feel safe in our marriages. God wants us to feel uh, absolutely secure in our marriages. God wants us to be free in our marriages, and that doesn't happen if either of the partners is looking over the fence line wondering what's on the other side, right? So don't mess around with the purity of your marriage. Don't introduce anything icky into it, right? Nothing. Uh, and don't mess around with anyone else's marriage. And the old rule here is, is still operative, right? Sex is for marriage. Marriage is for sex. Uh, that if you're not married to someone, you shouldn't be having sex with them. Uh, and, and I know that sounds just terribly old-fashioned, uh, but that, that is the rule before God. Uh, and, and you guys are way too young, way too young. You know, I know that, that sometimes there are seniors uh, that, that try to, uh, 
uh, date ninth grade girls and date their, you know what I'm trying to say. Absolutely not, right? I mean, the t this, this decision uh, is best made by you when you are in the full powers of your adult life. Uh, and you're not right now. You're dependent on your parents. You, you are incredibly vulnerable. You can't, you can't legally give yourself to anyone else. Right now it is illegal uh, for you uh, that, that the age of consent uh, is, I think it's actually 18 in Wisconsin for, you know, for, for full sex. Uh, but just whatever the number is, um, for sure, where you are in your lives, it's illegal. Uh, and, and it's nothing but vulnerability and pain for you. D don't even think about it, right? Think about other things. Think about school. Think about algebra, right? Think about anything else. Get your driver's license, right? Practice your adult skills. Practice communicating with people that, that, that make you a little bit crazy. Uh, practice being gracious in difficult situations. Practice the parts of marriage that you can practice, right? Being patient, being forgiving, working hard, being cheerful, even when you don't necessarily feel like it. Right? Seeing the need of someone else and meeting that need. There's lots of stuff that you can practice before we get to the sex part. And, and I just encourage you with my whole heart uh, to wait till you're in the fullness of your adult life uh, to, uh, to even think about it and then to wait till you're married uh, to, to participate in it. Right? Uh, the expectation of God, and again there's forgiveness for sins, but the expectation of God is no sex outside of marriage. That Marriage, uh, that sex is for marriage, marriage is for sex, that that's, that's what it's for, all right? So to do something else adulterates your future marriage, period, right? And again, I know how old-fashioned that sounds, uh, take it up with Jesus, right? Uh, next words of the phrase that pays, at the wrong time, at the wrong time. That's four words, now you should be up to seven words total. I do need to say, uh, that, that the reason I'm giving you these total number of words is that some of you still have less than half the words in your phrase that pays, right? That shouldn't be, right? When we're up to seven, you should go and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Are you at seven? If you're not, go backwards. All right, so that's, that's where we are. Now, it's not just your body that you're supposed to keep free from adulteration, right? From impurity, right? You're also supposed to keep your head and your heart and your mouth, the whole thing should be chaste. Chaste is a very old word. You should look it up. Um, but it's a, it's a beautiful word that, that you are without blemish, that you are without contamination of any kind, that, that you and I are supposed to be chaste in all of our, in all of our actions, in all of our expressions, right? That we're not supposed to be people of dirty talk. We're not supposed to be fantasizing about goofy stuff. We're not supposed to, to, to make any part of our body impure, much less diseased, right? That, that we're supposed to someday be able to present ourselves to a husband or a wife, you know, with a, with a pure, clean body and a pure, clean spirit so that we build whatever we decide together to build, right? That there's no, there's no influence uh, and no contamination from the outside. It's just you and that person building something lovely together that's just for the two of you uh, that, that, that no one else is a part of and no one else can be a part of. You know, the two of you come to this thing and build something new and clean and wondrous, right? So we're supposed to be that. And we're supposed to do everything we can to protect our neighbor's purity and honor, right? I mean, it's one thing for, you know, if, if you, if you we're, we're, we're giving yourselves over to, to, to dirty thoughts and to dirty speech, and it just polluted you, right? That's a, you know, it's bad. It's dumb. Why would you pollute yourself? Why would you create a polluted person to give to someone else down the road, right? So it's dumb. But that's not how it works, right? When you dump pollutants out into the world, it's not just you that suffers the contamination. It's everyone else, too, right? That, that everyone else that you share these, these thoughts with or these jokes with, uh, or this rough and crude speech with, anything that you do that, that cheapens uh, or demeans marriage or purity or, or the bonds between uh, married partners, you know, anything that you do there, that it, it, it hurts your neighbor's purity, that, that you're polluting them too, right? And you know, if you were dumping pollutants into the river, we'd all come and, and make you stop because we all drink from that river. And you need to start seeing that you know, whatever you put out into the, into the world, 
other people are receiving, other people are hearing or getting. And so for you to be a good neighbor and a good citizen, what you should be putting out into the world should be something you think about, that you should be thinking about, you know, what can I do, what can I say that lifts people up, that builds up important institutions, that helps people be their best selves, that helps people other than me keep these commandments. How can I talk, how can I live so that other people get the sense of it. And if you had a sense that, that God created you wondrously, that your body, your desires are beautiful, and that they're worth shepherding and protecting until you're in uh, a, a covenant marriage you know, where you share them with this one other person, right? that, that spreads into the world too, that it's not just pollutants that spread, it's, it's righteousness that spreads, and that you have it in your heart to make the people around you better, to, to live higher, to be different people when they enter their marriages. Right? So we don't cause anyone else to fall into sin by what we say or how we live. We never interfere with someone else's marriage. It's not funny. Right? We don't flirt with each other. Uh, you know, we, don't, we don't just uh, see if we can get somebody interested. Right? We don't break up someone else's marriage. We don't do that. Right? It's a violation of the commandment. Now again, right, we've talked about it in every sense. I know that, that some of you uh, are in... Uh, divorced or reblended families, right? And and the last thing I want is for you to be looking at your parents, you know, condemning them. They have their own responsibility before God. They have their own stories. But remember, we've talked about this is the expectation of God, and this is where we spend a lot of time living, right? This is really prevalent here. God wants us to be like this in our sexual lives, and we're like this, and this gap here is where every single one of us needs to be talking to Jesus, forgive me, set me free, help me to do better, right? And, and Jesus does. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves your parents. Whatever, whatever mistakes you or they have made or will make. But let's just be clear that this is the intention, right? That God wants us to live lives of purity and chastity until we are partnered and then when we're partnered to enjoy one another uh, mutually and, and exclusively that that's the plan and the purpose that God has for us. And, and anything less than that, you and I need to acknowledge, is outside of God's plan. And you and I need to, to, to the best of our ability, amend our lives, to aspire to live in God's plan, whatever's gone in the past. Right? Starting today, this is how I want to live. Uh, and asking God to help get us there. And then aware that there's that gap, uh, which is why we need Jesus. Right? So, um, I, I want you to change how you think and talk about marriage. Our culture loves making fun of marriage. If you, if you watch TV, you know, uh, comedies on TV, uh, there's always doofy people who are married to each other, who yell at each other, who hurt each other, right? You can't imagine why they're still together, you know, how these two horrible people got together. Comedians make fun of marriage, of married people, but, but we think that married life is not something to joke about, right? We think it's not something to, to, to do sly little, you know, whispers or innuendos about. We think that marriage is something splendid, right? That it's the object of serious divine care and concern, that God cares about marriage, that God ordained it, that God said it's not good for us to be alone, that when God created us, God created us for these sorts of relationships. And you learn things in a marriage that, I'm not going to say you can't learn them any other way. Let's say it this way. Marriage is an unbelievably effective way to teach you some really important lessons about yourself, about your character, about the limits of yourself, about where you need to work on things, about your lack of patience, your lack of grace, your lack of generosity, your lack of concern for another person. That marriage is a place where you learn uh, how, to, how to ask for help, how to receive help, how to give even when your heart is broken, right? And again, I'm not talking about abuse, right? But, but in normal marriages, there are struggles and hardships that, that create a different kind of person uh, on the other side. Uh, that the things you learn in marriage are very difficult, and they're very difficult to learn other places. There are also joys in marriage that, that at least some of them might be found other places, right? Camaraderie, laughter, communication, connection, mutual purpose, 
right? Uh, shared financial goals. You can find those in different places, but to have them all together is is and can be a wondrous thing. So so marriage is is a school of tremendous value. It is a building block for a stable society. It is a a, a the place where, where children do best, we know. And again, I'm not talking about your parents. We know that children do best in, in healthy, stable two-parent families. We know that. There's, there's, there's no question about that. Right? So, can kids do well in single-parent families? Yes. Can kids do well in recombinated families? Yes, of course they can. But, but if, you're, if you're talking about what's best for children, we know. We know. We know that, that if, if, if you finish high school, if you, if you get married, right, your kids have a chance to do so much better statistically than, than if you don't do those two things. Right? That, that there's, just, there's just no question that, that marriage is an important part of a stable society. And there's no question that God cares about it. Right? Jesus, uh, the old words, hallows and, be and beautifies uh, the wedding, wedding of Cana of Galilee with his first miracle. You know, that, that Jesus thought marriage was important and precious, and his first miracle was at a little wedding in Cana of Galilee. Right? And so you and I, we're, we're not supposed to, to laugh about marriage, we're not supposed to make fun of marriage, we're not supposed to, to think that it's, it's a nothing, it's a nonsense, it's, it's, it's optional. Well, I mean, it's optional in the sense you don't have to get married. But it, it is part of God's plan for the broader creation, right? And we're to view it in the light of God, uh, in the light of God's Word, which adorns and sanctifies it. God's Word lifts up marriage as an institution worthy of our respect. And so you and I are supposed to grow in respect for it, how we talk about it, not, remember, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us. Right? Uh, the next words in the phrase that pays is the wrong person. Is the wrong person. And put like at least two, maybe seven exclamation points after that, right? You you think it out how many exclamation points that you want there, but at least two. That's that's four words. You know, there's eleven words total so far. Now this this last thing um, is from Luther's large catechism. It's printed there. You should be reading it with me. So Luther says this. In conclusion, let it be said that this commandment requires that everyone not only should live his life particularly also his married life, in chastity of thought, word, and deed, but should also love and treasure the wife or husband given by God. So there's two parts there. That you and I, right, God's expectations, that you and I, in our thoughts, words, and deeds, are supposed to honor marriage and we're supposed to keep sex for the purposes for which God ordained it, nothing else, right? And that when God gives us a partner, we're supposed to honor that person. We're supposed to treasure that person. We're supposed to love that person as a gift of God to us. It's another reason not, never to cheat on your spouse, right? Because we think God gave you that spouse, that God intended that you would learn the lessons you were supposed to learn and become the person you were supposed to become in and through your connection to that person, right? So we don't cheat on gifts of God. We don't cheat on treasures from God. Um, the, uh, the last thing uh, from the phrase that pays, uh, you should write the word anonymous. I don't know who wrote that thing, right? Uh, that's one word and there's 12 words total, including that last word, anonymous. So I put down here a Bible story for you to remember. Uh, very quickly, you know, you can look it up in 2 Samuel. Uh, th these are books in the Old Testament. There's 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel comes first, right? Um, but starting in chapter 11, there's a story of David and Bathsheba. David was the king of Israel. Uh, he had riches, he had power, he had many wives, he had many concubines. He's up on his roof one day, he looks across and, and on a nearby building there's a woman bathing on her roof, Bathsheba. He, uh, he asks the servants, who's that woman? Uh, they say, that's Bathsheba, she's the wife of Uri uh, Uriah the Hittite. Uh, who's Uriah? Well, he's one of your soldiers who's off fighting. David says, he's away from home. They say, yep. He brings Bathsheba into his house, has sex with her, even though she's married to someone else, right? And then she is pregnant. And he's got a problem, right? Because Uriah the Hittite is away fighting for David. He can't get his wife pregnant. If he comes home and his wife is pregnant, there's going to be, you know, an instant awareness that there's, there's been uh, uh, infidelity, that there's been cheating. So David um, panics 
And, and he does, you know, once you start cheating, it takes down so much of your character, right? So, I mean, this is a story about all the parts of David's life that, that fall apart uh, because of and in light of his cheating. He has Uriah uh, sent home from the front. He brings Uriah home, uh, and Uriah appears before him, and David says, uh, well, how's the fighting going? And Uriah gives him a little report. He's not a commander. He's just a soldier. He doesn't know much. Right? And David listens and then says, well, thank you very much for coming. Why don't you go home and see your wife, and then you can go back to the front. And Uriah says, uh, there's no way that I'm going to go home and enjoy uh, the pleasures of my marriage bed while my brother soldiers are fighting and dying. Uh, I'll just camp on the front lawn. And David says, no, 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 you should go see Bathsheba. Because he's thinking, you know, that, that maybe Uriah can't count to nine. Uh, and that if Uriah goes and sleeps with his wife, he'll think that maybe the baby is his. Right? Um, but but uh, Uriah won't do it. He camps out on David's lawn. Right? And uh, David tries to get him drunk. He's still, even drunk, he's a man of honor and won't, won't uh, go home while his brother soldiers are, are fighting and dying. Uh, so David comes up with this really wicked plan, and he, he writes a letter uh, to his commander, and he seals it, and he puts it in Uriah's hand to take to the commander, right? A death warrant. The letter says, uh, put this guy, Uriah, where the fighting is the heaviest, under the walls of the city you're attacking, and when the fighting is the heaviest, pull back and let Uriah get killed. Can you imagine the betrayal of trust that a king and commander uh, is, is ordering this kind of death for one of his most loyal soldiers. And then he puts the order in Uriah's hand. So Uriah brings this sealed order to his commander, the order that, that he's supposed to let it, this guy get killed. Right? So Uriah does that. And the commander obeys this order. You, you know he had his own thoughts. You know that this broke trust between David and his commanders. Right? And can you imagine getting that order? And then pulling back and allowing a, a loyal soldier to be killed. They do that. Uriah's dead. Uh, Bathsheba goes into mourning, right? And then when the 30 days are mourning up, David scoops her up, makes him his, uh, and marries her, right? She doesn't have any real choices in any part of this. She doesn't have any choice when David calls her to his bed. She doesn't have any choice here, right? He just takes her. So, uh, you know, what, five, six months later, she has the baby, right? And uh, the prophet Nathan comes to David. Uh, and says to him, I got, uh, I got a problem. I ran into a situation uh, driving me a little bit nuts. Uh, I don't really know what to do with it. And David says, you know, bring it to daddy. So Nathan says, you know, there's this rich guy. He's got all kinds of flocks and herds. You know, he's, he's, just, he's just as rich as can be. He lives next to a poor guy. The poor guy has one lamb. It's like a family pet. Uh, you know, they, they feed it by hand. The kids cuddle it. You know, it's, it's like their puppy, right? So anyway, the rich guy has a visitor, and uh, he has to feed the visitor. He doesn't want to take one of his own sheep or goats uh, or, or, or cattle to feed the visitor. Uh, so he sends a servant across the fence line, grabs the neighbor's pet lamb, kills that, feeds it to his neighbor. And I, I really don't know, you know what kind of punishment is right for that. And David says, I do. The rich guy should die. He should absolutely die. You know, he had everything that, that a person could want, and he stole uh, from the poor man, the one thing that he cared about, he should die. That's my command. That's my royal command. And Nathan said, well, interestingly, king, I am talking about you. Nathan knew what had happened. All the servants knew what had happened. I mean, we don't need to even imagine that God told Nathan. You, you think any of this could happen without the palace servants knowing what, what had gone on? That you know Bathsheba had been called to David's bed, and then uh, everybody knew, right? So uh, Nathan says to David, it's you, right? You got all of these wives, you got all these concubines, you got all this, this riches, and you took Uriah's his wife, whom he loved, you took her for yourself, and then not only that, you had him murdered, right? So God's punishment is the baby that you just had with Bathsheba is going to die. And David uh, asked that God would forgive him, right? He wrote one of the Psalms here, you create me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Right? Cast me not away from your presence. It's a beautiful psalm. Right? David really was heartbroken, heart sick about, about this mistake that he'd made. Right? Uh, he prayed and he prayed and prayed. The baby did wind up dying, um, you know, which was, was a terrible sadness. And, and imagine this relationship between David and Bathsheba. Right? That, that she finds out that, that he had her husband murdered. She knows that he took her when she was still married. Now their baby is dead. Right? Imagine. It has, it's just turning to ashes. 
right? They wind up having another baby and David promises that this baby is going to be the next king, which angers his older sons from other marriages. Uh, David has in his family not one, but two sons uh, put together armed rebellions against him, start civil wars to try to pull him off the throne so they can be king instead of him and instead of Bathsheba's second child with him. That, that his whole life turns to goo uh, and many beautiful parts of his life turn to ashes because he broke this commandment. He committed adultery. He brought impurity you know, into his life, into Bathsheba's life, into their bed. Right? It's a story for you and I to think about and wonder about that, that this is not a commandment that we break that's just sort of a discreet thing. That we find that when we break this commandment, we also find ourselves lying. We also find ourselves uh, injuring the reputations uh, of those around us, saying things that aren't true, rewriting history to make ourselves look better. That there's this cascade of brokenness that comes. And it would be so much easier. Your life would be so much better if you just got clear that because God loves you, God says, I'm going to give you a partner and I want you to build a high fence around that relationship. I want you to build something beautiful inside there that's just for you, just for your partner. Don't spend any time looking across the fence line. Don't spend any time bringing dirtiness into the thing. Make something beautiful and pure and wonderful for the two of you. Thus says the Lord, sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. All right, that's a lot of talk. Talk to you later. See you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.